Hello, this is Matt. Kose. Mark. Guillaume. James. Mel. Zach. This is David. Terrier. This is PSG Talking. Le seul podcast sur le PSG en anglais. Hello and welcome to another episode of PSG Talking. I'm your host, Ed, and today's show is being recorded on Monday, May 18th. And we've now gone more than two months without a PSG game, so fun times. But we're going to try to fill out the show. Uh, joining me today is Matt Gooding and Zach Donabedian. Uh, Matt, let's start with you. How are things over there in the UK? Yeah, they're all right, mate. Uh, lockdown's still on. My hair's getting longer. Yeah. The... Uh, Time where you can acceptably start drinking is getting slightly earlier every day. Other than that, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I feel you on the hair thing. I'm starting to get like a Edrin Rabio kind of vibe, so I need to get yeah. <laughs> address that soon. And Zach, how are, you're in the states with me, so how are things on your end? Things are uh, going well here in Ohio. Stuff is uh, opening up a little slowly, but luckily the weather's getting warmer, which should help at least pass the time. But all in all, things are going well. Fantastic. Well. Always good to have you guys here, and we haven't had any games, but there's, as always, plenty of PSG news to talk about. So up first, I mentioned Rabia. I want to talk about our old friend. Um, he reportedly did not return to training. I think it was him and Iguain were the only two, and uh, Iguain was with his sick mother, I believe, in uh, South America. So he had actually a good reason, whereas Adrian Rabio just is, is wanting a transfer away from Juventus, and so he decided that he wasn't going to show up while his mom and agent tried to work out a deal to get him uh, sent away from Juventus. Um, I've seen Arsenal, Everton are linked um, with with the former PSG player. So I want to ask you guys just general thoughts about Rabio being Rabio once again. We've seen this old story. And then um, do you think there's a team that will just be a good fit and just allow him to do whatever the hell he wants to do? We can start with you, Zach. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this guy is uh, just doing the same old, same old. And I really thought that Perhaps some of the issue might have actually been in Terro Henrique and that it was a two-way street, but it every passing day makes it look more like uh, he and his mom just have this thing going where they just want him to be, you know, the number one midfielder on the biggest clubs and nothing less will satisfy them. So I'm, I'm not I'm not surprised, I guess. Um, I don't know which club would decide to put up with this. I guess the most reasonable I've heard was Everton, mm -hmm. but... Uh, yeah, it's just funny looking back at this time last year when he said Tottenham was too small of a club, and then now you have him potentially leaving. So this guy just, uh, he, he's mixing family and business, which is always risky, but in this case, uh, they really just do not have the chemistry working out, and uh, his mom just seems like she is really tough to deal with, so... Uh, yeah, that's, I, that's probably my thoughts on it. I completely forgot about that. He said Tottenham was too small of a club for him, and and so now he's been at PSG. He calls all kind of waves there. He went to Juventus, which is a very big club, causing waves there. And you know, I guess maybe he thinks that Carlo Ancelotti. But I'm, at this point, I'm just thinking maybe he just needs to start his own football club. You know, <laughs> find some dirt somewhere and start his own football club, make his own pitch. But I don't know, Matt. What do you think? What do you make of all this? Yeah, uh, so Adrian Rabio, I mean, you said that Iguain's been with his uh, sick mother. Uh, Rabio, of course, has been with his sick mother his whole life. Uh, she's obviously <laughs> sick in a slightly different way. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure that somebody will still take him. I mean, this is crushingly predictable. And I seem to remember that the Juventus fans were like going on about how they'd got an amazing bargain when they like nicked him off first for free. Uh, and you can see the thing is people always, because he's a very talented player, people always give him a chance he's still relatively young you can still like i think he functioned at psg for a while didn't he i find it hard to remember all in between all the tantrums but i think there was like one or two seasons where he sort of he sort of bumped along with nothing that's sort of really bad happening but i do think it's indicative like the teams that are interested in him of his like bad attitude because he shouldn't be at arsenal like no offense arsenal or everton fans if you're listening but that's a definite step down from psg and juventus isn't it so I think that's indicative of where his career's going if he doesn't like buck his ideas up. I think he's probably, I know, you know what's like in football, there's always someone willing to take a chance, there's always someone who thinks they can be the person who will turn the problem child around, you know. Uh, but in this case, it's a problem child and a problem parent. So you sort of, you take on 
twice twice as much trouble. So I don't know. I think Everton maybe that'd be good for him because Ancelotti's had him before. He knows what he's getting himself in for, and uh, I think he must have. Did he make his breakthrough when Ancelotti was our manager? I can't really remember, but um, that sounds about right. That's, yeah, I think that'd probably be a good environment for him. It's a bit less pressurised, and maybe he'll uh, maybe that'll be the time he sort of knuckles down and uh, starts fulfilling that potential. So I wrote a piece a while ago about how like I think that Rabiot to just achieve his full potential actually has to come back to PSG, kind of like that prodigal son has returned. Like he's an asshole, we all know this, but like he's ours. You know, we, we kind of we built him up, and I think for him to ever return to his former glory, if he ever had one, back. I think it has to be back at PSG at some point. Maybe he'll be like 33 and finally realize the error of his ways. But I don't know. Do you think? Ever he will return to PSG. I mean that that could be quite the redemption arc if he yeah. comes back, captains the team to like the first Champions League <laughs> or something. Like, yeah, uh, I, I thought so. that there was a good chance that he might have even stayed uh, after Antero Enrique left, or that he would come back eventually. But after this and what he's doing and the bridges he's burning, even at Juventus, it's like I'm I'm just not sure. You'd have to wait several years to see what happens in his career for me to even want him back. It's just. You really have to have a great locker room in addition to being a good player. And it would be great if he could come back and redeem himself. I just, there's no evidence that that's going to be the case, though, so far. I mean, so. would it be possible? I mean, the priority this offseason, Leonardo has said, is a tall midfielder. Rabio fits that. Money's going to be an issue with the coronavirus. We could get Rabio for basically nothing. And could you come up with some kind of contract where you put in there, you act up once, you're out of here? You know, something that's like ironclad and he's got to be on, you know, on his best behavior or else he's out. I, I mean, don't he... see Veronique <laughs> I mean, taking that contract, though. The, 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 <laughs> the, no only, the only solution would be to make put a clause in to say that he has to live with Paredes and basically <laughs> any any bad stuff he does, he has to answer to Paredes. I think that could, <laughs> that could work quite well. But other than that, no, I'm not. No, I'm yeah, not via gonna, via not a slide tackle as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Paredes has become quite the enforcer. Uh, so, all right, well, we touched on Rabio. I th- last time I read, he's, uh, he's in Italy, but now he's got to go through the quarantine because of the virus and everything. So we still won't see him in action for quite a while. So... Um, next topic I wanted to talk about. So France football, they published their list of the 50 most powerful figures in world football and, uh, PSG president Nasser Al-Khalifi topped the list. Uh, so do you agree with that decision? And then I also want to ask you, what do you think is the next major decision that he's going to make? That's going to kind of rock the football world. Do you think it's, yeah, you know, buying leads QSI was interested in that, or maybe is it selling Neymar and Mbappe next summer? What's what's the big ground breaking decision you think he's going to make? Is it denying Newcastle their new owners? Maybe uh, we can start with Matt. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I read uh, what France Football had to say about Nasser, and uh, it sort of does make sense with his all his various connections to to different people. Uh, so I can see where you why you would come to that conclusion. And at the same time, you'd look at the FFP uh, sort of situation, how our punishment was a little bit lighter than the punishment that uh, Manchester City are currently trying to fight. I mean, albeit in slightly different circumstances. And you'd have to say maybe his (laughs) influence has come to bear somewhere there. I don't know. But in terms of his next big decision, I mean, I think it's quite a sort of fundamental one is that what do the... QSI want to do with PSG after the World Cup 2022. I mean, we don't know when football's going to start again and what form it's going to be in, but the next World Cup's going to come around very quickly. We know that the decision to invest in PSG was driven heavily by the sort of potential to have that link to football and the marketing and everything, blah, blah, blah. But after the World Cup, do they still need that? Do they still invest as heavily? Do they row back a little bit? Or do they look to move it on to somebody else? I think that's probably a, a big decision for him. And of course, you know, actually, no, I won't say that because it might be a little bit dodgy. Yeah, so I think um, uh, I think just what QSI do with PSG in the next sort of in the medium to long term is probably the thing which, well, I imagine that they're thinking about quite a lot. Yeah. What is, you know, QSI obviously is the shareholder of PSG and you've got the Qatar National Bank, but like, does the average person relate Qatar, PSG, World Cup? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if those dots all connect for the average football fan. 
Yeah, I mean, you would have to say it must do on some level because rich people keep doing it, don't they? So, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I guess having the players over, you know, to do warm weather training there and to do the tours and the friendlies, prestige friendlies and stuff like that, that must, I think it's obviously we've got a whole podcast about the whole soft power business, haven't we? I guess it's yeah. a little bit to show off, isn't it, to your to your mates and again, do they need that after they've had the World Cup? They sort of think, oh, maybe we'll get something else to show off about. I don't know. But I think the, the angle of the Saudis coming in potentially at Newcastle might make them keen to keen to stay around for a bit because uh, obviously we know there's a bit of beef there, to yeah. put it politely. And we do have a question about Qatar in the uh, Twitter questions, so keep that in mind. Um, Zach, what do you think? Do you agree Nasser is the most powerful man in football? And uh, what do you think his next big decision is going to be? I definitely think he's up there. Um, I was looking at his biography, or not his biography, but just kind of all of his accolades. And I mean, this guy wears about 15 different hats. He's the chairman of BN Media Group, the chairman of Qatar Sports Investment, president of PSG, the president of the Qatar Tennis Federation, the vice president of the Asian Tennis Federation, a delegate for the UEFA Executive Committee, and a member of the organizing committee for the FIFA Club World Cup. And despite being involved in all of that, you always see him at matches. You see him at training. I mean, this guy somehow jams 48 hours of work in a 24-hour day. He's a vampire. So, I'm, I'm convinced he's actually a vampire. It's pretty impressive. I, I could easily see how he's the most powerful. Um, in terms of his next big decision, I think Matt's example is definitely a little deeper. But it, for me, I think what would be sooner is potentially organizing some form of tournament in Qatar for PSG to compete in because Ligue 1 has ended early. And they might still be playing in Champions League in August. There were some rumors that they might be organizing something with Lyon and Saint-Étienne or just other clubs in France. So I'm not sure how the French government will or the league will take to that. But that's probably his next big uh, decision to make in my eyes. That's just the soonest that we would see, at least, that has a direct impact on PSG. No, those are two great examples. I still think it's going to be blocking the sale of Newcastle to the... Saudi Arabia owners because of the whole copyright issue and of stealing being sports games because I think they have the Premier League rights. So I think blocking that, which is not going to ingratiate him to the Newcastle fans, but what can you do? You know, it's all business, I suppose. <laughs> they're just going to have to get over it. I know they have grandeurs of, you know, they're going to sign Edison Cavani and all these other players, but I think he's going to manage to block that somehow. <laughs> We'll see. I guess that'll be the true test of how powerful he is. If he can literally like block a takeover of a club in another country, <laughs> that's, that's quite a lot of power, to be fair. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, let's keep it moving here. We actually had some actual football this weekend. We had the Bundesliga. Uh, before we get into my question, I want to ask you guys, Bundesliga team, who do you guys like to see do well? Zach? Oh, man. I don't, to be honest, I don't know. I'd, uh, I, I don't have an affinity for many of the Bundesliga clubs. Okay. Um, I spent one day in Frankfurt once, so I'm supposing that I hope Frankfurt gets back to their levels of last year, but I, no connection, really. I'm just enjoying watching all the clubs, frankly. It's just nice to see live uh, football again. Totally. What about you, Matt? Uh, also not a big Bundesliga watcher, to be fair. I think uh, I quite like Hamburg because they're sort of comically <laughs> bad. Uh, like Not comically bad, but comically like sort of uh, unfortunate that things always go wrong for them. I think they're in Bundesliga as well at the moment, aren't they? So, uh, uh, but I'm not a not a big fan, to be honest with you. I quite like Dortmund as well, yeah. just for the whole sort of fan experience. It's meant supposedly amazing. But then I uh, I upset all the Erling Haaland fanboys this weekend on Twitter. So, <laughs> so <a> dangerous <laughs> lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll be going over there anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, I always I kind of like Leipzig. That's my team, just because they're off in East Germany and everyone hates them. It's kind of like PSG, and they have a lot of really nice young French players. So I kind of gravitate oh. towards them. I can feel their pain of just being hated by everyone. So yeah, okay, why not add another club? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, but with that league returning, and it seemed like it went well. No one collapsed on the pitch that I know of. So did Ligue 1 get this wrong? I mean, did they cancel prematurely, or is just the situation in France so? much worse i mean what are your thoughts on that uh zach i'm not sure i do think the decision was premature it's might be too early to tell if it was the wrong decision um i can't imagine though imagine if it were la liga or the premier league that decided to end their season early i would think that the rest of the leagues would have followed suit but unfortunately for league on they just don't have as much of a uh, 
status among the top leagues. It, it'll just be tough to tell, but it definitely puts them at a big disadvantage when it comes to European competition. But I think, unfortunately, time will tell just as we really see how this experiment goes uh, with with Germany's league. And then I think Premier League and La Liga have players coming back to training this week or next week. So we'll find out in a month or so. It's I, I think it's too early to tell, but I really do think Liga should have just waited, suspended the season indefinitely until they had a little more data to make a a good decision. It looks like Serie A saw just before we started recording today that uh, that I don't think any games can take place before June 14th, I believe it was. So they've got a little ways to go. Um, looking at some of the results, Matt, most of the road teams won. I think it was like all but one or something like that. It was definitely lopsided. So even though the games have returned, what about the integrity of these games? You know, there's really no home field advantage. Does it taint the 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 results the the over overall you know champion i mean the bundesliga is really close at the top of the table so is this a whoever wins it you put an asterisk by their by their name for this season uh yeah i don't know it's really difficult isn't it i think that it's better some football is better than no football and them finishing it like this is preferable to cancelling or doing points per game or whatever the various things which other leagues are doing at the same time I think it's too early to tell as well to your sort of main question because nobody did collapse, that's true, but they haven't released the testing results yet, have they? So if a load of players have got COVID this weekend, they'll probably have to stop the Bundesliga again or if, like, say, two or three teams have to go into quarantine or whatever, that's really going to mess up the schedule, isn't it? So I think the other thing to say on Liga is that it wasn't Liga's decision, was it? It was the government were just like, we're not having any sports so too bad for you and i think that was a bit of a surprise uh so i guess time will tell as well but personally i'm i'm I've, i'm not keen on sport happening at all to be honest like i've got family members in france like have various health conditions and the idea that a load of tests would be used for footballers mm. and might not go to some people who actually need them sits a bit wrong with me so i I can see both sides of it, but I think we'll just have to wait and see. But I can, you know, I think probably Lee Gunn would have liked to have held on for a bit longer, but the government sort of took it out of their hands, didn't they? Yeah, I mentioned Italy. They said like June 14th, but in France, they were like nothing before September. Um, yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting. You've got Leipzig. They're into the quarterfinals. Bayern Munich, they are all but there. They beat Chelsea soundly in the first leg. What happens if later in the season, one of those two teams, you know, half their team test positive for the coronavirus and then the next week or so the champions league resumes and maybe psg plays leipzig what happens in that situation do they forfeit and psg goes to the semifinals you know like there's a lot of questions yeah, up in the air yeah it's just such an it's such a fast evolving situation that uh, i think the idea that we can we can definitely say the Champions League's happening in August is probably a bit sort of fanciful at the moment. I don't think Premier League, the uh, the leagues in England are creeping up like the ones that are cancelling. So I watch Cambridge United in League Two, so that's like the fourth tier, yeah. and we've just kind of avoided our season and we're doing points per game for the for the end of the end of the season. So I think that'll probably happen for the league above as well. And then you get to the Championship and the Premier League, and you're sort of like, well how are they going to continue when half the rest of the football pyramid's all been cancelled and then if that then they're going to be in the same situation as the french teams basically so i don't know i think it's it's so hard it's so, it is there is going to be an asterisk by it because it's such a the the sort of uh situations in the countries are so different aren't they that you can't really have a fair a fair comparison yeah, it makes you wonder. To your point, it makes you wonder: Is it even worth it? You know, giving all these tests. Yeah, and exactly, exactly. And just what's the point? I mean, I guess you can argue philosophically whether football is football without supporters. I mean, I watched a bit of the Bundesliga. I kind of, I because I, I was all set to be like, mm, this is going to be rubbish. But actually, it was football. I hadn't seen any new football for a while, so I was like, oh, this is all right. It's not too bad, but it's not the same, is it? Like, yeah. The only good part that came said. out of that was the one guy on Schalke who's on loan from Barcelona, like cursed out. Halan was like, told him to go <laughs> f his grandmother or something. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh god. There was I also. Did, that. did you see the goalkeeper who was taking a drink? I think this was in the second division. He was taking a drink in the net, and he wasn't paying attention to what was going on in the other team's court. It was really simple. I don't know if that was this weekend or whether it was like an old clip, but I think it was this weekend. Was that was Kevin really Trapp? Really it wasn't our. 
Yeah, <laughs> probably, yeah. Oh, no, no, that wouldn't be surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, well, let's keep it moving here. So there's been no shortage of transfer rumors. It's pretty much all I've been writing about, one thing after another. So we've got, what was it, Kamara at Marseille was possibly linked with a move to PSG, which I don't really think so. Nelson Semedo at Barcelona. Uh, Tellez, we've already talked about a lot. Um, Donnarumma, AC Milan, there's several AC Milan players that have been linked. Um, we actually did an interview today with uh, one of their writers um, for an AC Milan blog. But I want to open up to you guys. Which one of these signings are you most excited about? Which one makes you feel like you want to buy the kit right now? We'll start with you, Zat. Uh, I have two guys, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I know we've talked about Telles, but considering our potential lack of depth at fullback uh, next season, I think he would be an obvious answer. I saw he was the eighth, rated, high, or eighth highest rated uh, player on who scored for the Portuguese league. I mean, he can do a little bit of everything. He can dribble, he can cross. Uh, he's a dynamic player. I think I even heard that he could, he can potentially play both sides, left and right fullback. So uh, that would, that would be a great signing. And he's also Brazilian, so he would get along well with a lot of the existing players. Um, another guy that I saw a few weeks ago, I'm not sure if the, the uh, trail has kind of gotten cold over this guy, but uh, the Leicester City uh, midfielder, uh, Inigne Inigne and Didi. Um, yeah, yeah. He's fantastic. He's He was number four in tackles in the Premier League, number one in interceptions. Uh, very similar player to Idrissa Gay, mm-hmm. a guy that you think might have three lungs. And uh, the big thing is he's only 23, so... Although we already have a pretty robust midfield, the potential to have a guy like that, uh, I think, is invaluable. And we've seen how valuable it is this year to have a good midfield in European football. So um, that that would probably be my top two, those guys. I mentioned Ndidi at Leicester, and uh, I tweeted it out, and their fans seem to think that he would just is astronomical, his transfer fee. I mean, he's so good um, that we just couldn't even afford him. Maybe that's the case. He's also not... Very tall, which is what Leonardo wants, but definitely I, I, everything. I mean, he's like Conte. I mean, he's he's really a, a good player and would add a lot to our midfield. Um, so I agree with you there, um, Matt. What do you think? Any signings got you excited? Yeah, I mean, I like this idea that we might take camera off of Marseille, <laughs> firstly because he's really good. Like he's really good. Like, and he already is in Liga, yeah. and. Uh, also, it'd be funny to sign a player from them, wouldn't it? Just to see what happened. Like, I just uh, hasn't happened for a while. Like, I remember that. I was trying to remember that guy's name, the midfielder who went to them from us. This would have been like about 2005. I'll go and do some googling in a minute when I'm. Uh, but he he came back and he scored and he really annoyed the fans. It was obviously not enjoyable. But did I read that Kamara's dad was part of like the Marseille Ultras or something like that? Someone told really? me. Uh, possibly, yeah, I don't know. That'd make it even funnier. Like, although you can't imagine his dad would let him come. But in all seriousness, I think that would solve a, it. Would fill a hole for us, and uh, on a sort of rational level, that's a signing that would make sense. But yeah, indeed, he would be great as well. Actually, I mean, he's. You'd say you're absolutely right, Zach. That he's got a similar profile to Idrissa Gay, but what he has got is he's a lot better in the air, and he's um, obviously, you know, not a bulky guy, but he's quite a sort of tall guy, and I think he'd fill that brief that we're sort of looking for in midfield as well yeah i wonder if we could get him though because lester's probably going to qualify for the champions league which means you know money's yeah. every team could use money but do they need it that bad with that kind of influx coming in you wonder yeah yeah that's it i guess it depends doesn't it how whether he's happier being the sort of main man in the midfield at leicester or whether he wants to try his arm at psg yeah. and you know he's not going to be like that he's not going to sort of take Verratti's place as he for example he's not going to be the first name on the team sheet but maybe he thinks a bigger club like yeah. might might tempt him over maybe no yeah I would love to see that signing another one um that I that I'll pick for mine when I saw this name come across the transfer rumor wire was uh Serginho Dest uh, the the American Dutch defender he could play left back he could play right back and uh, I think he would be amazing he'd sell a lot of shirts here in the states um, I also, Colin Dagba just posted a video. He looks really good training. He had like this Rocky four. He's out in the woods, like running you know, <laughs> over the cones and everything. <laughs> he's ready to go. He's showing no signs of slowing down from that knee injury. Um, and, you know, we'll still have Tilo care. So those two players and you bring in a young player like Dest, a lot of potential, let him have a season in Paris and develop a little bit further. And maybe he's the right back for the future. Ajax is a selling club, but um, Bayern and I think was also reported uh, Barcelona are interested in him. So a lot of competition for him, but maybe that's a player we could convince and 
I just after Tim Weah left, I, I wouldn't mind another American coming into the squad. <laughs> it's great for marketing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we should also say they were planning. PSG was planning on coming to uh, the states for the summer exhibition, but that's probably. I haven't heard anything official, but I can't imagine that would happen given everything that's going on in the world. Um, let's get into some Twitter questions. Thank you, everyone who sent Twitter questions and some really good ones. Um, kind of following our conversation about transfers, but at that New Yorker uh, wants to know if you had to buy a solid player in only one position, would you buy a right back, a center back, or striker? We know that PSG's priorities left back, right back, and a tall midfielder, but of those three choices that he gave, which one? Um, Matt, which one do you think? What would you, what would you buy? Center back, right back, or striker? Hmm, that's a tough one. I think that probably, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd probably go for a center back because I'm a bit sort of. Uh, I think that there's question marks over all of, or part, there's question marks for different reasons over all of them. Marquinhos, do you play him in center back or center mid? And the rest of them. Uh, Thiago Silva obviously great but old the rest of them you know sporadically great uh, sometimes a bit ropey so I think that one like really dominant sort of heir to Thiago Silva uh, that could go in there and even be either be the alternative to Marquinhos or the partner for Marquinhos depending on how you look at it would be my sort of priority of those three uh, yeah and especially positions. if you could uh, sign Koulibaly or somebody like that to, to come yeah. and sign back would be fantastic. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, when we I think we discussed it on the last show I was on, didn't we? That yeah. that would be an ideal signing for us. Somebody of that profile would be amazing. Yeah. What about you, Zach? Yeah, I would I would say center back as well, but just because Matt already said it, I'll just go with uh, right back. I mean, it looks like we don't know whether or not we're going to keep Cavani. I think room the last I saw that he might actually be working out a deal to stay so you know in Chupa Moting I think also is coming back is what I heard so we might have the depth at striker enough but as of now if, with Munier leaving we only have Colin Dagba right back and I suppose Carer he's kind of in between center back and right back so some depth at that position is definitely needed yeah that's definitely a position in this modern game that is crucial all the top teams have a, a world-class right back you think of uh trent alexander arnold at liverpool so i definitely think i would agree that that's absolutely a position i think we've got some options diallo Kempembe, marquinhos i think we could cover for silva's absence i would love to still see a center back come in but of those three choices i would say right back is probably most crucial at this point um, at Garrett Armwood wants to know, do you think PSG will be at a competitive disadvantage in uh, the Champions League versus teams who have a domestic game still to play? And uh, they also I referred to this earlier. What about an idea of exhibition between uh, clubs with domestic games to keep players fit? So maybe something like in Qatar, um, some kind of tournament. So what do you think PSG at a disadvantage? We'll go with you, Zach. Absolutely. I mean, watching some of the Bundesliga games today, you it, it seemed a little obvious, at least to me, that the players were a bit rusty mm. in the competition, and especially in the first half of the games. It's just something you need to play against other teams and other clubs to, to get your rhythm back. And without that, I, you're just at a huge disadvantage. It's, it's, for me, it's really that simple. Um, if they can figure out logistically how to get a tournament going in another country... That's great, but it, I just, it seems like it would be incredibly difficult to pull off with all of the travel restrictions, and it's, it's just so early to tell what things will look like in August when Champions League resumes. So. Yeah, but August 7th, it, I think, is what uh, mm -hmm. the Leon president alluded to is when their game would start, so yeah, August 7th. Yeah. Um, Matt, what do you yeah. think? PSG had a disadvantage? Uh, I think yes and no. I think that I was actually quite impressed with the sort of speed of the Bund I think that the games that I saw or the bits that I saw were a bit like you say they were a bit ragged I think you could tell they hadn't been playing but actually the sort of core fitness and the sort of speed of the game seemed quite decent which would make me think that our players would similarly be able to get up to speed quite quickly but I guess I guess you can make the other point that you know, if we're not playing, it's unlikely we can pick up <laughs> any any injuries, any sort of Neymar can't like break his toe or whatever. Well, yeah, hopefully not. Uh, and yeah, I, I I think you don't know what the other leagues are going to be doing as well. I think the Bundesliga is playing at the moment, but they're the only ones. So clearly, if everyone else swings back into action, it might be a bit difficult. But 
I can't see that all the leagues will be running. So I think there'll be other teams with problems to deal with. I don't think we'll be the only ones there. Yeah, and this injury, they run the risk of in, in injury. They run the risk of getting the coronavirus. The whole team getting it. And I think if that were to happen, they would have to be disqualified from participating in the Champions League. So it could go either way. I mean, you never want to see any team or players go down with injuries or especially a virus. But they're running the risk by playing. That's that's one thing for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, at Philip D Ortiz ninety six wants to know how many games will PSG most likely play before the Champions League starts up again in August. I think for sure they're going to try to get the Coupe de France and Coupe de Liga in the yes. finals. I think they're going to try to get that is what I was reading, and it would start maybe right before you know they play those two games right before the Champions League is set to resume. So you know at most they would get two games, and then we've already talked about the tournament in Qatar. Do you think that? I think it was like St. Etienne, maybe Leon, PSG, maybe another team, like four different teams just Leo, playing. I think. Yeah, Leo maybe. Um, do you think that's something that could actually be pulled off? And I don't know, Qatar in the summer. <laughs> Is that a good idea? <laughs> True. They, they'll just build an indoor yeah. stadium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I mean, it doesn't sound all that realistic to me, to be honest. Like, if you can't play a game, I can't see how – if they can't play games in France, they're going to be allowed to fly halfway around the world to play games. It just doesn't sort of logically make a lot of sense. But on the other hand, Qatar have got a lot of money and, you know, money often talks in these sort of elite sports, doesn't it? So, uh, uh, I don't know. I, to be honest, I think that would be of limited use anyway, because they're not, they're, it's only a friendly tournament, isn't it? They're not going to be playing at a full tilt anyway. So it might be good for fitness, but beyond that, I, things like that i don't think are yeah. gonna make a massive difference either way is a inter-squad match with psg are those oh, players more the... talented than saint etienne maybe <laughs> well <laughs> if you're facing chupo as a defenders <laughs> you're probably like this is probably better for me than facing like dembele or whatever so uh so <laughs> yeah. well, don't disrespect sure that... chupo like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then there's also the issue i don't believe you, anyone can fly into qatar currently they've got like a travel ban so that would be something yeah. that needs to be lifted so i think there's just too many hoops to jump through and psg i i don't know if they'll be allowed does anyone know if they're allowed to train before september in paris if they've gotten approval for that or will they have to go elsewhere to train i think it's very much in the, up in the air right now yeah. So, all right. Here's the question I've been looking forward to asking you guys. This one comes from PSG Talk contributor Eddie Razo, and he wants to know who on PSG is likely to sneak off without warning and become a member of the NWO. And of course, this is in reference to Dennis Rodman of the Chicago Bulls and uh, the Last Dance documentary that was on ESPN. And during the, I think it was the '98 Finals, I believe it was. Um, he just after a game left, and next thing you know, he's showing up on TV on uh, WWE wrestling uh, with Hulk Hogan and other members of this wrestling faction. And um, I think he was called like Rodzilla. If you're watching this on, uh, <laughs> on YouTube, I'm going to throw up a picture here so you can see them. But uh, so yeah, he just left in the middle of an important competition. So let's say PSG gets to, you know, later stages of the champions league, which player do you think is most likely to just leave the squad and join a wrestling faction uh, on TV? We'll go with, uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, I mean... And we should say you're not a basketball fan. You didn't know anything about this. We had, we had, a, um, we had a little conversation off air about my basketball knowledge, and I literally forgot what the Chicago Bulls were called. I was like that team <laughs> that Michael Jordan and Rodman played for. Um, uh, I would say probably Kazawa, because uh, yes. it just seems like the sort of thing that he would do, like to sort of go off and probably play another sport. Uh also, he'd be. I could see him in in wrestling as like a villain, basically. Just kind of, not probably not a villain, like the sort of butt of all the jokes, just like wandering on, like oh, where am I? Oh, I'm in the wrestling ring. Oh, look, uh, Triple H has just like you know thrown a metal chair at me or whatever. So I'm probably dating myself there massively with my wrestling uh, references. But yeah, so I think Kazawa could def- He's definitely the one who I'd expect. Or going back to previous players, Hatem Ben Arthur, obviously, because oh. there was that thing when he oh, was. My uh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he seems like the kind of guy who'd uh, who'd get himself into some kind of trouble. But of the current squad, Casala, uh, I think. Yeah, that's a great pick, um, Zach. Who do you think? I'm going with Icardi. I just think he would show up and uh, 
somehow Wanda would find a way to get into the ring as well. (laughs) Yeah, as well. Yeah, there's just limitless marketing potential there for Wanda and the Accardi family. So (laughs) may even get Maxi Lopez in the ring as well as his opponent. Oh, the love triangle storyline. I love that. Yeah, the biggest project for a while. Yeah, yeah. uh, people would definitely tune in to watch that. So I'm I'm going with Accardi for sure. You guys' picks is great. I was gonna go with uh, Neymar. It just seems like I don't even have a reason. It just seems like something that he would do. Maybe not this season because he's been. very professional but in the past i could definitely see him disappearing dyeing his hair you know whatever color and showing up and hitting someone over the head with a chair i could see that even though we all know it's fake he would find a way to get destroyed though (laughs) he would come (laughs) up injured yeah Yeah, he would go for sure lucas moore would be his tag team partner i reckon just like on the sidelines there waiting while neymar's doing all the like special moves more will be there waiting to be tagged in I Neymar love that idea. Launched out of the ring. Yeah, <laughs> I love the idea of Icardi and his, and his wife Wanda like just throwing him a chair and being his like manager and you know accompanying him to the ring. I can see that. Absolutely. Very good. All right. Well, hopefully, Eddie, we answered your question there. Um, all right. So at uh, Klein Ken wants to know, what are your top three picks for captain after Silva leaves? So let's just assume he's not going to get extended. Um, Zach, who do you think? Is it like give me three options for captain? I don't. Three would be tough. I, I think I might just go with one because I, I just have a short list. I know my guy, and it would just be it would be Marquinhos, a hundred percent. I don't even think I would. I mean, I had to go for two more. I guess Cavani, if he's staying, he's just he's such a model player. But you just worry about the dynamic with uh, Neymar and the other players still. Yeah, it'd be tough for three for me. I I just think Marquinhos is my guy. He he was a fantastic captain for the return leg against Dortmund. Yeah, it's hard to and, argue against the guy that um, had a giant tifo of his like yeah. at, at the stadium. Um, Absolutely, Matt. Who do you think? Uh, well, I think of, I think Marquinhos is the obvious choice, and I think it was interesting to hear him talking in the Dortmund game. Obviously, when there wasn't a crowd, he was talking all the way through, like just like, and that's what you want from your captain, isn't it? I think for the sort of left field choices I think Kim Pembe as a uh, <clears throat> possibly not a the character that you would associate with the captain normally but you know it might be a good opportunity for him to grow into the role and he's obviously a local guy and I think you can't put a price on that um, or maybe even Neymar himself I mean it depends if he how long he thinks he's going to stick around and I think if you've listened to this podcast before you guys will know I'm not like always the biggest fan of Neymar but I think you can't argue with his professionalism on the pitch and his work ethic and I think obviously his talent is amazing so I think as an example to his teammates and you know a leader on the pitch I think he definitely fulfills those roles quite well at times and I think maybe even being the captain would lift him up to a greater height and make him feel like the team was was his own sort of thing. No, all good choices. I would say I'm with you. Marquinhos, I think he's number one. If Mbappe wants to be captain, he says he'll sign an extension and make him captain. You can be here's your armband. Yeah. Whatever. We don't care. Sure. You can have Love it. it. <laughs> um, so that would be my second choice. And then I know sometimes he can be a little bit of a hothead and make stupid decisions, but I, w- I would say Verratti. He's been here a while. He just signed a contract extension. I think he's <laughs> probably earned it. He's one of the first names on the team sheet, so He'd be great in the match. Just everyone would end up with a yellow, but you know, <laughs> worth it. <laughs> exactly. All right. Here's the last one we got from um, at PSG AJ, and they want to. And he wants to know what formation is Tuchel going to go with next season. Obviously, a lot of this depends on who's here and who's not. But uh, do you think we'll see the, you know, attack minded with four forwards on the pitch again next season? Probably not, right? Um, we'll go with you, Zach. Oh man, I. <sighs> I'm not sure. It's just it's so hard to tell when you don't know who will be in the squad next year. But I, I still think that you have to keep your best players on the pitch. And so the the four four two that transitioned somewhat to a four two four when we were attacking, it seemed to be successful. And you can get all your your best players on the pitch. So until I see something else that works, that's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, I agree with that, Matt. What do you think? Um, I think a lot will depend on what happens with the sort of central striker situation, whether Icardi is going to be retained, whether Cavani is going to be retained, whether we'll try and get someone else even. But I think potentially if we don't keep Icardi and all we've got is Cavani, then I could see him going back to a sort of more of a 4-3-3 because I think Mbappe as well will probably 
again, with you sort of referred to his contract situation earlier, I suspect that he thinks that he should be playing through the middle as the main striker of the team. And uh, uh, if PSG want to keep him around, which I assume they do, then maybe we'll end up giving into that and seeing how that goes. And if that did happen, you could see him as the as the main striker of a free with Di Maria and Neymar either side sort of thing. So potentially that, I mean, I was not a fan of the 4-4-2 when we, or four, whatever you call it, thing. <laughs> yeah. A funny hybrid, fantastic four formation. Yeah. But having persevered with it for so long, I've kind of got used to it now. So I, I would be, wouldn't really mind if we continue to try and make it work. But uh, I could, I think the only other option really would be the sort of 4-3-3 and Mbappe through the middle. Yeah, I think we may go back to tradition, maybe a 4-3-3. I just, in my gut, it tells me if Cavani was going to stick around, we would have given him a contract. He seems like That's true. he would prefer to stay here. And if he, we haven't offered him something by now, especially now with the long layoff, then I think he's probably as good as gone. And, I mean, Icardi at $70 million, and does he really want to be here? You know, or would he prefer to be in Italy? And I think if he did go back to Inter Milan, it would, um, Gab Marcotti, uh, ESPN reported that it would basically blow up their wage structure. Like they cannot keep him. They would have to sell him. And so I, I say, let him go back. And that takes Inter out basically of the transfer market because they got to figure out how to deal with them. So that's one less competitor trying to sign other players. And I think maybe Leonardo could find someone cheaper that's just as talented to bring in who actually wants to be here. And so they, he could be the, the main striker and then have Mbappe and Neymar on the wings. I like your, I like your strategic thinking, Ed. It's very <laughs> impressive. I think you might be the most influential person in football in a few years without <laughs> really thinking, taking the, uh, taking the opposition out by uh, sending them their own players back. It's a great idea. I think so. Take them out. I mean, Inter. I don't know if they'll have Champions League football. I don't follow Serie A too closely, but you know they're a big club. I think that they could yeah. be in the running for a lot of, you know, uh, Tonali maybe. I mean, there's a lot of players that would be interested in going to Inter. So why not take them out and say here. Thanks for Riccardi. Now you now he's your problem. You deal with trying to get rid of him cuz we already know he he's not going to stay there. The ultras hate him. He you know, they banned from the club yeah. at some point, so let him go back and uh, let them deal with it. <laughs> well, that was all of our questions. Thank you everyone once again for sending those in. Um, before we get out of here, let's just go around and let people know how to find you on social media. We can start with you, Zach. Uh, sure. My uh, Twitter handle is papadon_ underscore. Um, just regularly tweeting about PSG, mostly recirculating our own content. So, <laughs> and Matt, when you are not bashing Erling Haaland, how can people find you? I mean, football Twitter people just take things so seriously, don't they? It's like obviously Erling Haaland is a good player. Like he's really good. He's a pleasure to watch. Like it's just a joke. Like calm down. Like all these mad people. Anyway, uh, you can find me on Twitter at PSG Tourist and. Uh, yeah, tweet in a load of nonsense usually. So, but yeah, come and follow me, please. You know, I think Halan's uh, buyout option at Dortmund's cheaper than Icardi. <laughs> just go sign yes, him. Yeah, I mean, oh my god! Can you imagine? I think it would be, <laughs> hopefully he doesn't follow me on Twitter because if he sees all that from the weekend, maybe he'll be like, "No, see you later, Paris." But uh, yeah, I don't think he's very active on Twitter. Just... It'd no. be great if he just came over and the whole team bought into the Zen meditation <laughs> celebration. <laughs> the club starts selling T-shirts and all that. Yeah, I love it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening and checking out the site. And uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening.